I didn't, I didn't know the theme was first, but I'm going to try to fit it into the theme. It's going to be... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is uh, my first time approaching the Mexican border, and then my first time uh, inside Mexico, both of which were a complete disaster. So I'm going to try to, try to make sure I fit it in the time here. So the first time I, uh, I approached the Mexican border, I had, uh, I had just gotten expelled from school. Um, I, I, uh, I, got a, I got a poor grade in, uh, in Spanish immersion, and uh, the teacher kind of just asked me, you know, what, what grade did I need to not get expelled? Because I was on probation, because like, I had dropped out and I was returning to school, and the circumstances normally wouldn't get you expelled, but because I was on probation, um, you know, it was a serious issue, and uh, I was I was at uh, I was at my hearing, and my philosophy advisor put in a good word for me, and it just so happens that the uh, academic uh, dean of students uh, really looked up to my philosophy advisor, so he was ready to let me go. But it turns out that um, I put all these flyers around the school, you know, uh, regarding some some day of some day of like protest and not attending classes, and he was like really upset about that, and put out an all faculty email, but it was, it was kind of anonymous, so no one knew that like, I was responsible for putting up the flyers. And I, and I told him at the hearing about this, and uh, it was kind of a disaster, so I, you know, I went and waited in the next room for about 45 minutes while they deliberated and read my 20-page essay about why I shouldn't be expelled. But I ended up, I ended up getting expelled anyway. <laughs> so uh, I walked about you know, 10 plus miles from, uh, from Hamilton College in Clinton, uh, straight, I believe, straight to the train station. And uh, I, got on a, I got on a train. I got on a train to El Paso. So uh, I went out, went out to Cleveland. And uh, in Cleveland, uh, some interesting people got on the train. And uh, one guy was uh, a guy that worked on oil rigs. But he was also uh, a studio bassist. And he wrote songs. And uh, he, he had a hat that said, Fool Soldier. And uh, you know, he was a Native American. And so he'd write country or western songs about like with Native American themes, and uh, there was also a guy that was in like this older guy. He was a, he was in a a big band and like had lots of money and like lived on an i on an island like off of Long Island, and uh, he was in the band Courtney Love, which I had never I had never heard of before or looked up since. But um, <laughs> they're they're interesting people to be on the train with. So it went, the train goes to Cleveland and then down to um, East Texas and then across to West Texas. And I get off the train and I, they, you know, we've been, on, on the trains there's a lot of these like breaks where you get off and you might not be moving again for 10 hours or so. So I was hanging out with these couple of guys and a couple other of our friends that were with us. And so when I got off in El Paso, they kind of knew that I had no clue what I was doing. So I didn't have any money and actually didn't even have any ID because I, I had been jumped uh, a couple years prior and my wallet was taken. And in like one of the best, in the, one of the best uh, neighborhoods in the city that I live in, Utica, and uh, I never got a replacement ID back then. You know, the times were simpler, and you could open up a bank account just with a college ID. But uh, and I did that. But um, in in El Paso, you could walk right across the border. Like there's a bridge, and you could just walk right across if you just have, you know, if you have like a valid government issued ID, which I didn't have. So I end up uh, sitting out outside of the train station, and uh, it's supposedly El Paso touts itself as like the most secure train station in the world, and they have like, you know, these guards that carry revolvers, and you know, I, I would hide like somewhere out there, and it's freezing because it's in the desert, I had two pairs of jeans on, and just going into hypothermia, and they'd send, you know, they'd find me and send me somewhere, and I don't, I don't remember, uh, I don't remember where I went, but I, you know, I just kind of walk around the city a little bit, and then, oh, eventually I went, I, you know, because it's, it's, right, it's right on the border, so I was going to kind of like sneak across the border because I couldn't like go across the border. And there's just, there was just some school or something like next to an you know, industrial building, and there was kind of a hill, it was like all sandy. And, uh, you know, I slept up, I, tr I tried to sleep up there, and uh, there's just like a fence, you know, just like a tall fence. It's like you know, 12 feet or something, it's like barbed wire. And it's like, oh, I could, I could just climb that and get right across. There's some houses on the other side, no big deal. And in the morning when I wake up, you know, there's, um, I'm about you know, ready to get going, I'm going to go climb the fence. And these three, these three like planes, like, like I don't know, like, like uh, 
F-16s, like, are just flying, like, real slow, like, right overhead, like, I don't, I didn't know they could fly so slow, and because I'm on this hill, like, they seem like they're right above me, just going, just, like, you know, monitoring the border, and, uh, you know, I kind of got freaked out, so I ended, up, I ended up going back home, luckily, you know, I was able to call my dad or something, and I had, you know, a credit card that I was able to use, because I was actually, I was actually broke, but I, I was able to go back home, but then, um, some months, some months later, um, I ended up doing Hurricane Katrina disaster, relief work. And after about, after a little more than five months, I was talking to a kid named TJ. I had just finished uh, digging, digging ditches for a community garden. I dug ditches for a month and uh, six days a week for a month. And I was pretty upset with, uh, sorry, I'm going to drink some water. I was pretty upset with uh, how, the, how things were going there and just, you know, the country. And I was going to join this revolution. I had heard at some point about uh, Subcomandante Marcos and uh, the Zapatistas. So I was gonna, I, uh, yeah. It just so happens that the, uh, the Gulfport Airport has flights a thousand miles south in the same time zone to the, the, the southmost, uh, the southmost airport in Mexico, which is actually nowhere near where I needed to go. I still needed to go west into the Yucatan. But, um, but I, I know I did that one day, so I just up, I just up and said, all right, you know, I'm leaving this. You know, I had this argument with this kid about politics or something. And I just, I grabbed Barry Lyndon off the bookshelf, and I have an MIT water bottle that I had. And I didn't have any bag or anything, just the clothes on my back. And I had some money that I had taken from, from a credit from a credit card. They, and then they gave me these checks where you could get cash out of an ATM or something. So, like, way before, because I knew my credit was going go to was gonna go to shit. So way before, you know, five months prior, I had, I had, I had no money, so I, t I withdrew the $500 and knew that it was going to be, you know, just bad credit forever. And I used part of that and part of, like, a buddy pass my uncle got me for Delta, and I, I was going to fly to Oaxaca, except the thing was they had these really, these really old machines, and you had to, like, call and do it all over the telephone because the machines couldn't handle, like, credit cards or something, plus I had to, like, split like credit and cash, it was, it was, comp or no, like the buddy pass and cash, was, I had just this weird thing, and then it was late, so I missed, I missed the flight, so I couldn't call people back from hurricane camp to come pick me up, so I had to end up sleeping in the, in the woods outside the airport, or trying to sleep, I didn't actually get any sleep, and it's, it just turns out that um, all planes leaving after that were canceled, like in both directions, supposedly because of weather, and the next, the next day when I was able to get the flight, um, they had brought in a bomb sniffing machine, Overnight, but um, I did actually I did actually make it to Oaxaca, and I had no idea what I was doing. And the, the cab driver, the cab driver was asking for for thirty, and I only had twenty dollars on me, and I was all upset, and I didn't really speak a word of Spanish, and I thought he was asking for thirty dollars. Apparently, he's asking for thirty pesos, which is much less than uh, thirty dollars. And I was like having this like heated argument with him. I was, I was so angry, and uh, you know he he went to report me. He brought me back to the airport and went to report me to this the stewardess that he knew that was bilingual, and I just said, oh, you know, I'm a college kid, and I'm just going camping. But really, I was just trying to get out of this crater, because it turns out that Oaxaca, Oaxaca is in a crater, and uh, I was just trying to get past the mountains and the houses and the barking dogs to get into the woods, and I was going to kind of try and do like a survivalist thing and work my way <laughs> east to Chiapas and then try to find, you know, try to network with the EZLN and the Zapatistas. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> So uh, he, you know, he, so I tell this lady and the story, and she's like, "Oh, it's no big deal." So I go to get back in the cab. I'm talking to the cab driver. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to leave this guy alone. But then some police officers start coming. The 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 airport security. They have this like SUV that's like you know really nice, and they have like fully automatic weapons. And and the cab driver gets freaked out. It's like, all right, just just get in the cab. So he drives me, you know, a little ways away from the airport. We have another argument, kind of. We don't really understand each other. And, and I get out, I drew him a diagram before, which really freaked him out. I was trying to show him that I was just trying to leave the city, and I was not trying to go to the hotel and, and what have you. But I ended up getting rained on, and my passport got ruined, and I woke up to a volley of gunfire. Turns out there was another revolution happening in Oaxaca at the time uh, with this political movement, the APPO, that I was not aware of. And uh, it was kind of like uh, like the, the Mexican like National Guard and like was brought in, like, right around that time, like, right, ex like, right as I was getting there, things were, like, shit was really hitting the fan, it had built up over a long time, and, uh, you know, I, I slept outside the airport another day, and then I heard some more gunfire and things, and I heard people marching in the streets, like, shouting in Spanish, but, like, I didn't know what was going on, because, like, I didn't do any research before I went there, and I didn't know, like, I didn't know, like, what the deal was, 
And, uh, you know, I called my dad and told him, you know, Dad, I need you to buy this. Like, I hadn't talked to my dad in five months before that. I'm like, Dad, I'm in Mexico. I need you to buy this ticket. The number is, and I had this, like, little number where he could call up and use his American Express to buy a ticket. He did that, and I was able to come home. And I went on the computer, and I saw all these pictures of, like, buses on fire. And there was, like, this autonomous area around the university where, you know, protesters were staying that the government couldn't officially go into. But eventually they did. And, I don't know, like, I survived, but apparently, like, college students wanted to see, because, like, people were getting detained and tortured who were trying to join up with the APBO at the time, so they started um, profiling college students specifically for detainment and torture. So these, ironically, these kids that wanted to go see what that was all about, other kids, these were, these were like, Mexican kids, uh, they, I heard that they got detained and tortured, and uh, fortunately, fortunately, I, you know, I, I got out of there, except when I was going back to uh, San Antonio, <laughs> Uh, I was walking. I was walking out of the baggage area, and this guy freaks out. And he's because I don't have any bags. He's like, why don't you have any bags? I'm like, well, I, I travel light. And he's like, well, where are you heading? And I'm like, Syracuse. And I hand him my tickets, and he freaks. He's like, it says Cleveland because there was a transfer. But and then he's like, send him through the X-ray. But you know, I just I, I ended up getting you know detained and interrogated for a half hour. Like I still had bombs in my body and things. Back then they didn't touch you. Like you know the the TSA there was no pat downs. Like I got interrogated for a half hour because I might be a terrorist or something. I had no bags. It's kind of sketchy. And back then I had like long hair and a long beard. But uh, I just went home and I went back to hurricane camp for another couple weeks and I went home again. And uh, this is a story that my friends make me tell people, but I think I need to rehearse it a little bit more. But thanks, thanks for listening. That was great. Thank you, Marco.